Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Amen. <clears throat> If you have your Bibles, open them to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Today is officially the first Sunday of Advent, and the word Advent means arrival or coming or appearing. And every year during Advent, we remember Christ's first arrival into our world when he was born in Bethlehem as our Savior, and we are reminded that Christ is coming again. That he will come in power and in might and in victory to judge and restore his creation, making all things right. As Christians, we look forward to that day, knowing that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, this is why one of the very last verses of Scripture prays, Come, Lord Jesus. Uh, we long for the day when Christ will return, because life in the resurrection will be infinitely better. And so today we are talking about our hope, the hope that we have because Christ came and the hope that we have in light of the fact that Christ will come again. And I want us all to ask this question of ourselves today, how does the hope of Advent affect our daily lives all year long? How does the hope of Advent affect our daily lives all year long? Let's stand now as we look to God's perfect and authoritative word in Isaiah 2 verses 1 through 5. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. And will be raised above the hills. And all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob. That he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. and Never again will they learn war. Come, house of Jacob, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time that we have together. And Lord, we ask now that you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. Lord, we pray for those who are unable to be here with us today. We pray for the Eads family who was with us in the earlier service. And we pray for Kay, that you strengthen her and heal her. And Lord, that you would give them your peace, which surpasses all understanding. God, we ask now that you would help us to give attention to your word. That you would help us to open our hearts and our minds to it, to receive it, Lord, and to have our hope secure in Christ. Lord, we pray that through this time and your promises, you would give us a greater hope than we came here with. Lord, that you would help us to see that Christ is sufficient for our hope, that Christ is the one who is going to make all things right, and that Christ is the one through whom we are able to have life today. So we pray now that you would be with us. We pray that you would strengthen us through this time in your word. We pray that you change us and make us more like Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Very shortly after I'd become a Christian, I had an uncle who passed away. Uh, his name was Jack, and he was a man of great faith in the Lord. Uh, I had a lot of respect for him. I always enjoyed spending time with him. Mostly saw him at family reunions and Thanksgivings and Christmases and those types of things. And I had prayed for his healing, uh, but still he was sick and he died. And I remember uh, being very down about that, as anyone would be, uh, after his passing and uh, talking with my pastor after I'd found out... And, my pastor offered a word in that moment of darkness of hope. 
He simply told me that ever since Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord, death is a part of life. Death is a part of the curse of sin. It's something that we all have to face. But because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, for those of us who have been saved, death is gain. We have victory over death because of the victory of our Lord Jesus. And so even though we grieve, as Christians, we get to grieve with a powerful hope. Because our great Savior has guaranteed eternal life for all who repent and believe in Him, as my Uncle Jack had done. And while He wasn't healed on this side of heaven, ultimately He had received His full and complete healing from the Lord. During our trials, we often need a word of hope. In Isaiah chapter 2, the Lord gives the prophet Isaiah a vision about what it will be like when God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. And it's a vision of hope that was given to the people of God during a time of great trials. When Isaiah prophesied these words to Israel, it was during a time when he and other prophets were able to look around and see destruction in Jerusalem. They were realizing that things were far from what they should be. In chapter 1, Isaiah cries out, giving a message from God for the people to repent. The people of Israel and Judah had rebelled against the Lord. Jerusalem was ravaged by warfare. The people participated in cult worship. There was injustice against the poor and the innocent, and those in power flaunted their power. But this was not the way that things were supposed to be. Way back in the beginning, the Bible teaches us, God created mankind in his image to bear his image into the world. We are his representatives, his governors over creation, if you will, given stewardship over the world. But we know that in the Garden of Eden, humanity rebelled against God. And through our rebellion, sin came into the world and has been passed on to us like a disease ever since that time. And because of sin, death, and corruption have entered into God's creation to the point that where God's good creation has been broken and cursed. Turning away from God, we turn inwardly toward ourselves. We turn away from our Creator, who is our only source of life, to creation, which in and of itself, apart from Him, has no life. And thus we became more corrupt and more broken as time went on. Romans 1, 21 and 22 says, For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Humanity sinned and turned from God, and now we all in our sin face the consequences. But we find that out of God's great love for mankind, God called the people of Israel through the line of Abraham, and Israel would be God's representatives to the rest of the world. He would be their God, and they would be His people. And through Israel, God would show all the nations His goodness and His faithfulness so that all people would draw near to the Lord once again by repenting of their sins. God would redeem the whole entire world through Israel. And thus he stated in his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So what happened? By the time we get to Isaiah chapter 1, the Lord speaks through Isaiah to condemn Israel for having fallen so very far away from their purpose. Though they had a calling to bring all people back to the Lord, Israel itself was made up of sinful people, and thus they fell away from the Lord. They rebelled against the Lord, and they failed to show the rest of the world who the one true God really is. At this time in history, it seemed to many as if all hope was lost. Israel had split into two different nations, and neither nation showed any reverence for the Lord. So those in the minority who remained faithful to the Lord wondered how his promises of redemption could ever possibly come true. So again, in Isaiah chapter 1, we find this darkness and hopelessness. We find judgment and indignation from God. We find the Lord calling out to the people to repent and be cleansed, and yet they refuse to listen. This was a depressing time for the people of God, and it was a dark time for mankind. But then we come to the hope of chapter 
two. A hope that burst onto the scene like a beaming ray of light. Things won't always be like this, says the Lord. But rather the day is coming when all the nations will see God. When all people will come to learn from the Lord, encouraging others to come with them. A day when no weapons will be necessary for there will no longer be any war. Again, in verse 2, now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. In Isaiah's time, many pagan religions thought of their gods as dwelling on a high mountain. So the Lord is saying here that one day there will be no doubt that he alone is God. That the God we serve, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is the one true creator, sustainer, and king of all creation. Verse 3. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations, and will render decisions for many peoples. And they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Again, God promised to his people Israel that a day was coming when all people of all nations would seek the Lord. They would seek to learn his prescribed ways so that they would be able to walk in his designed paths for us. They would invite others into his presence, and they would destroy their weapons of war, for they would no longer be necessary. This seemed like an absolutely impossible dream to many, and yet God would go on to make it clear that this hope would come about through the Christ who was to come. Israel's Messiah was the one who got the job done. He would be the Israelite who did what Israel was supposed to do. He would be God's perfect representative who would bring all the nations back to the Lord. God kept his word to Abraham through Jesus. And sure enough, we find that this hope was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Today, we see that from 12 disciples, Christianity has grown into the largest religion in the world. And it continues to spread today. It continues to spread to unreached places. People of every tribe, tongue, and nation upon hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ That Jesus suffered and died on the cross in our place as our substitute for our sins. And dying, he was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. Hearing that message, people of every people group are invited to turn from their sins and trust in Jesus Christ and be saved. And literally billions have. Billions from 12. Today we find that in Christ a family bond is created by the Holy Spirit of God that supersedes all other divisions, bringing about an unbreakable peace among all those who have trusted in Christ for salvation. Today we see that those who have received Jesus as their Savior are being sanctified, made holy, made more like Christ, and that they hunger to learn from the Lord and learn more about the Lord so that they might walk in His way. Brothers and sisters, the fulfillment of this prophecy and all of God's promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And yet we still, we still see that things are not completely the way that they ought to be. And that is because through Christ's first coming, God's kingdom has been brought about already but not yet. Already, but not yet. That's a phrase that theologians use, and it's an interesting phrase. At first it sounds a little bit contradictory, but how many times in life do we experience something that's happened already, but not yet? When we've eaten a meal, our body has been nourished, but not yet. We're full, but the nutrients still have to be broken down and converted into energy. When we've lifted weights, we've done the work of making ourselves stronger, but it hasn't happened yet. The body still needs to heal and rebuild the muscle. 
When we're engaged, we have totally committed ourselves to one person, but not yet. The marriage vows still have to be made. And the couple doesn't live together and enjoy the holiness and the blessings of matrimony. There are a lot of things we experience that have happened already, but not yet. And in the same way, God's kingdom has come to earth as it is in heaven already, but not yet. Jesus made it clear through many of his parables. We find two of them in Luke 13, 18 through 21. It says, so he, Jesus, was saying, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden. And it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Jesus' point in both of these parables is that though the kingdom of God is here now, it's like a seed that has been planted, and one day it will grow into a large tree. Or it's like a little leaven that once put into the flour eventually leavens the whole lump of dough. It is here already, but not yet. Church, we know that Christ, in his incarnation, initiated God's kingdom. In Matthew 3, verse 2, John the Baptist, being the forerunner for the Messiah, came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And once Christ began his ministry, his message, as we find in Mark 1, 15, was the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus inaugurated God's kingdom on earth. He planted it. He brought it about. This was the purpose of his earthly ministry But in our time and place, much like in Isaiah's, it's easy to look around and say that things are not the way that they should be. If we look at the world around us, it's tempting to think that the kingdom hasn't come yet. Today in our part of the world, we see a hardening in people's hearts toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see people turning away from truth and forsaking the natural and moral law of God. More and more people in our world are turning away from the Lord, embracing and celebrating sin, piling up their wickedness with glee. And each day in our culture, the church seems to lose more and more respect and become more and more of a pest. It doesn't seem at all like all the nations are streaming to the house of the Lord. It doesn't seem at all like many peoples are coming and saying, let us go up together to the house of God. People don't want us sharing the gospel because people do not want to hear about their sins. People want to cover their ears and avoid the truth. We also know how scary it can be when we turn on the news and we see of wars and rumors of wars. People killing each other, pillaging each other doing cruel, unspeakable things to one another. We live in a time where we can look around and feel that things are pretty bleak. We can look around and think that maybe all hope is lost. And brothers and sisters, sometimes, if we're being honest, it can seem that way when we look in the mirror and we examine ourselves. Not only does our culture seem to be in chaos, But sometimes our lives can seem pretty chaotic too. We can sit down and we can read our Bibles and come to worship and sometimes all we experience is guilt. We think about our failures. We think about our sins. We think about how we have neglected coming to the house of God and studying His ways because deep down in our hearts we were in a place where we didn't want to. The church to the glory of God, God says things will not always be that way. There is coming a day when all things, including our hearts, even us, we will be made right. There is coming a day when we will be free from all of our sins and all of our sinful inclinations. There is coming a day when God's kingdom, though it is already here, will come in all its fullness. And that day is the day when Christ comes again. And so we look forward to that day with hope and with anticipation, knowing that Christ our King is coming to make all things 
new. But brothers and sisters, not only will we experience the eternal blessings of his kingdom on that day, but if you are in Christ, God says you can experience the blessings of his kingdom right now. Jesus has brought about his kingdom in his church today. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst. Understand, if Jesus is your Lord, if you have repented of your sins and received him as your Savior, trusting in his sacrifice on the cross for you, then you have already entered into the blessings of his kingdom. Christ is already your king. He is already your champion. And therefore, through his power at work in you, you can overcome sin. You can overcome all worldly temptation. You can stand on the word of God and be his witness to those around you, inviting them, come, let us go up to the house of God that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. You can stand with Jesus knowing that even death cannot defeat you because to live is Christ and to die is gain. And church, when Christ comes again, bringing his kingdom in all its fullness, we will be raised to meet him in the air, welcoming him as our coming king, bringing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Church, this prophecy here in Isaiah 2, it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It has already happened, but we still await its complete fulfillment when he comes again. And as we wait, understand, all of us are called to respond to Christ now. Listen to how Isaiah called Israel to repent in verse 5. After giving the word, he said, Come, house of Jacob, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. We too, church, are called to repent. We're called to respond to this message in recognition that Jesus is king. Ask yourself this morning, are you walking in the light of the Lord? Today, maybe you have received Jesus as your Savior, but you recognize, as we talked about just a few moments ago, is chaotic. Sometimes it feels like you fail more than you triumph. Frankly, sometimes it seems like your heart isn't in it. And maybe you're tempted to think that your sin has created a permanent barrier between you and the Lord that you can never get past. You need to realize today that there is hope. The Lord is our strength and our shield. The Lord is the one who can heal us and pick us back up. The Lord is the one who cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And he is the one who has already made the perfect, sufficient payment for all our sins. This morning, if that's where you are, you simply need to come and humble yourself before the Lord. Confess your sins to him and ask him to help you. And if you will do that, God has promised that he will deliver you. He will give you the strength and the grace that you need to serve him and obey him. He will give you freedom from your sins, deliverance from your guilt, and restored fellowship with himself. Finally, this morning, maybe you've never... Receive Christ as your Savior. The Lord is calling you to repent and believe on Him today. Today. To be saved by turning away from your sins and surrendering your life to Jesus. Christ offers forgiveness for all your sins and eternal life in His kingdom, but you must come to Him to be saved. Otherwise, you will die in your sins and face eternity in hell which is what all of us, apart from God's grace, deserve. The scripture here today is clear. Many have repented and believed on Christ, 
But one day every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And in the meantime, all of us are called to repent and follow Jesus before it's too late. Would you come this morning to walk in the light of the Lord? Would you receive the hope, the guaranteed hope, that only comes through Jesus? Pray with me. Father in heaven, God, we thank you for the grace that you've shown us by sending your son Jesus to suffer and die in our place. And though he was buried, we thank you that Jesus rose from the dead, that we might be saved by believing on him. And God, we thank you for the hope that we are able to have today. Lord, in a time where things can seem so bleak, through circumstances that arise in our lives that can cause us to feel as if we are in a dark and isolated place. I'm turning on the news and seeing wars and rumors of wars and wondering why our world is in such chaos to looking in the mirror and wondering why we can't seem to figure it out. God, people need hope. We need hope. us who have been saved and trusted in Jesus as our Lord, God, we recognize that sometimes we fail you. Lord, and it is so easy to think that we're all on our own and that perhaps our sins have created too great of a chasm between us and you. Lord, if anyone's here today like that, give them hope that you will hold them fast. Lord, that you will hold them in your grace and that nothing they do can cause them to lose the salvation that you give and guarantee through Jesus. And Lord, if there be anyone here today who's never received Christ as Savior, we pray that you would help them to feel the heaviness of their sins this morning and help them to come to find the hope that is only in Christ. God, draw them to yourself that they would repent and believe today and be saved. Lord, you are sufficient hope and we need you every single moment of our lives so help us Lord not to leave here today without having the firm hope that comes in Jesus Christ and it's in his name that we pray